All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it is Wednesday afternoon. Um, and we uh, were witnessing some extraordinary events just the last week in our neighboring country of Haiti. And so um, I was essentially trying to put uh, uh, this panel of uh, discussing together to essentially understand what happened. So to begin with, I first must thank our student life here at Brow College and our amazing North Campus coordinator Leo de Rougeau for assisting us with logistics for this event. Also, I uh, must appreciate my appreciation goes to my ID, AD, Dr. Todd Bernhardt, and our uh, SPS HS pathway for also co sponsoring and doing their part for this event. My name is Mirsad Kriesturetz, and I'm the assistant professor of political science and international relations here at Brown College in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. For those who might not know yet, we were one of those two institutions in Florida that received, uh, they just received a generous gift of $30 million from a philanthropist, Mackenzie Scott and her current husband, Don, Don um, essentially for working hard to help local communities alleviate itself from economic hardship and assist them with their socioeconomic mobility. So obviously we are known for that type of work, for assisting and serving our community and for our approach to our community education. For that reason, we are also hosting today's event about Haiti, which is where many of our community members and our students come from, and they also have a connection with. I was provoked to do this event because some of my students from previous semesters that I stay in touch with reach out to me and ask me what's going on. Some of them express despair and pessimism and that made me upset. Um, and so I decided to organize this event where our local South Florida intellectuals from Haitian American community are going to talk, explain and define current turmoil in Haiti and show in that way that Haitians have reasons to worry, but for sure, they also have very much ground and reason to be optimistic and to hope for better times to come. Any people who have such fine intellectuals um, as we're going to see today, um, and we're gonna meet them should be optimistic. No matter how long and how dark a night might be, in the end, it will uh, end sooner or later. Having met here so many excellent Haitian American students and intellectuals, I'm sure that the dawn is coming sooner rather than later. Um, I have to first apologize on behalf of Ernst Vincent and Ronald uh, Joseph because they had some last minute obligations they could not postpone. So they're not going to be part of our conversations today, but we will have um, <coughs> uh, other participants uh, with us. So I'm the host of this event, by, uh, but our new uh, South Florida intellectual rising star, Renee, is going to moderate today, con today's conversation. She's now a senior at the University of Florida, majoring in philosophy with a minor in sus sustainability studies. She's spending this summer interning at the uh, Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery, where she's leading a research project for long-term management plan. <coughs> uh, it's Meadow Wildflower Restoration Area. Just a few semesters ago, Renee, right before the Corona um, lockdown, right? Renee was our BC honor student, and she was the chief staff of uh, student government at Brown College North Campus and North Bureau Chief for the Observer of the Brow College North Campus. We remember her and uh, we asked her to moderate today's event and she kindly agreed and told us that the Brow College is her school and she feels happy always to contribute. She's going to introduce our panelists for today and moderate the rest of the event so that I can also ask questions at the end because I am interested as well. So Renee, please take over from now. Okay. 
Um, hello, everyone. And again, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Professor Kudeshwats, for the kind introduction. I would also like to give an extra thanks to Broward College and Professor Mirza Kudeshwats, as they were kind enough to offer us a space to discuss our country and experience as Haitians. Now, our conversation will be conducted in English, but I would like to briefly welcome my Haitian friends and compatriots in Creole. Bonsoir, compatriotes. Merci de ce que nous venons dans l'événement ça, quand on a parlé de la situation qui arrive à Haïti. Je dis à peu comprendre l'implication de ce qui passe en Haïti et pour qui ça est important pour nous comprendre et assumer l'expérience. For the purpose of everyone understanding, I'm going to switch back into English. Each of our speakers will have 15 minutes to discuss their take on the turmoil in Haiti. We will be taking questions at the end of each speaker's presentation, but feel free to type your questions in the chat as you think of them. I will make sure to collect them and address them at the end of each discussion and also allow you to unmic so that you may ask any live questions. Now I'm going to introduce the panelists in the reverse order in which they'll be speaking. This means the first person that's introduced to you will be the last person to speak. So first we have Dr. Ransford F. Edwards, Jr. He's an assistant professor in the Department of History and Political Science at Nova Southeastern University. As a McKnight doctoral fellow, Edwards earned a PhD in political science from Florida International University in 2016. His research interests include disaster politics, particularly disaster capitalism. He explores social and economic justice through the transformative nature of natural disasters. Edward's regional areas of focus are the Caribbean and Latin America. His work appears in Class, Race, and Corporate Power, as he has been a reviewer for the journal Disasters. His teaching interests include quantitative research methods, political economy, and political film and fiction. Next, we have Pascal Robert. He is an essayist and political commentator whose work covers Black politics, global affairs, and Haitian politics. His work has appeared in The Washington Spectator, Black Commentator, Alternet, allhiphop.com, and The Huffington Post. He is a regular contributor to the online publication Black Agenda Report and is the current co-host of the This Is Revolution podcast, which is live streamed via YouTube and other relevant social media on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and Saturdays at noon. Pascal Robert is a graduate of Hofstra University and Boston University School of Law. Our next speaker, Professor Reginald Dardone, was born in Brooklyn, New York by parents who immigrated from Haiti. He graduated from the University of Florida with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and obtained a Juris Doctor from Nova Southeastern University. Professor Darbone practiced in immigration, civil litigation, family law, and securities litigation. He has been teaching for the past 15 years and is now at Broward College. He has two amazing daughters and enjoys playing tennis and building classic model cars. Finally, we have Mr. Claude Lucin, who holds master's degrees in political science and public administration and has devoted his life to community service by working with public and nonprofit sector agencies, community groups, and religious and academic institutions. He has also served in leadership roles as chairman of the Haitian American Community Organization of Broward, President of the Haitian American Democratic Club, Chairman of the Multicultural and Refugee Task Force, the Caribbean American Democratic Club, and as a member of various boards and committees with the Broward County Schools, including Teachers Recruitment Advisory Committee, Diversity Committee, Food Service Advisory Committee, Adult Vocational and Technical Education Advisory Committee, FEMA Food Service Advisory Committee, and et cetera. He has also had numerous speaking engagements throughout the state of Florida and Washington. He has taught business planning and entrepreneurship to scores of small business owners. He also conducted diversity training for law enforcement, including Broward Sheriff's Office and other governmental agencies in an effort to promote the importance of cultural diversity. He has frequently been interviewed by Island TV, The Sun Sentinel, Miami Herald, and New York Times on issues ranging from immigration, cultural diversity, and politics. Mr. Lucent is going to begin our conversation and we will engage our panelists with questions after they finish their presentations. So Mr. Lucent, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mirsad, uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Haiti is in mourning. 
Haiti is mourning uh, the death of uh, President Jovenel Moïse, who was killed as a private residence by uh, hired uh, mercenaries. Our prayers are with uh, the people of Haiti and the Moïse family. Haiti is also in mourning the death of uh, Haiti Supreme Court uh, Judge uh, Rodney Sylvestre, who was tested positive for COVID-19. He died uh, June 23rd at the University Hospital of Mirbalet. The death of uh, Judge uh, Sylvestre represent a huge institutional crisis in Haiti. Imagine the 12th uh, member Supreme Court of Haiti was reduced to six. Judge uh, Sylvester, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I should remind you was appointed earlier this year to replace uh, President Jovenel Moïse, whose term in office, according to the opposition and most institution in Haiti was supposed to end February 7, 2021. The late President Moïse uh, did not agree. He believed that uh, his term ends February 7, 2022. So you had a constitutional crisis in Haiti, and you can say that uh, that crisis has been resolved uh, by the death of President Moïse and Judge uh, René Sylvestre. But that crisis has uh, engendered, it has created another crisis in terms as to who become president of Haiti in case of a presidential vacancy. Uh, the constitution of Haiti, the, the constitution of 1987 provides that in case of a presidential vacancy, uh, a member of Haiti's highest court, la Cour de Cassation, the equivalent of uh, the US Supreme Court would assume the presidency. The, uh, the precedent has been established numerous times where you have uh, judges like uh, Erta Trouillot, Jonassin, uh, and others who assume the presidency in case of uh, presidential vacancy. However, uh, most recently in 2015, uh, the, the, the Haitian constitution was amended to allow the president of the Senate to assume the presidency in case of a, a presidential vacancy. It so happened that uh, the president of the Senate at the time, uh, Mr. Puyver, assumed the presidency. So this time, uh, the Haitian legislature is not functioning. Out of, uh, in the lower house, there are no representative because no election took place. And in the Senate, out of 30, you have 10 members. Out of the 10 members, eight members decided that the president of uh, the US and of Haiti's uh, Senate, uh, Monsieur Lambert, Joseph Lambert, would assume the presidency. So uh, technically, uh, Haiti is still in crisis as it pertained who would become president and also who would become prime minister. So as you know, Haiti has a caretaker uh, prime minister. His name is Claude Joseph, who submitted his resignation to the late president Moïse. And Moïse decided to nominate Ariel Henry as the new prime minister of Haiti. And his name was published in the national, uh, newspaper, uh, the national uh, newspaper, the Moniteur, so which made him the official prime minister in Haiti. It so happened that uh, uh, Monsieur Henry was not sworn into office. So basically you have technically uh, two uh, premier in Haiti, uh, Monsieur Joseph and Monsieur Henry. Uh, US Secretary of State uh, uh, Anthony Blinken called on pol political leaders in Haiti to uh, create uh, an inclusive vision to pave way for peaceful election in Haiti this year. Now, that's uh, uh, a serious challenge uh, when you consider the insecurity that exists in Haiti. And also, if you guys, uh, you guys are probably familiar with the observation made by uh, Albert Einstein that uh, the very definition of insanity is to continuously do the same thing 
expecting a different result. Haiti had numerous elections since uh, 1986, and unfortunately, those uh, elections have not produced uh, any substantial results. It should be noted that uh, Haiti is one of the oldest democracies in the world. According to Haiti's constitution of December 1806, Haiti after the United States became the second republic with a democratic form of government uh, and not a monarchy. Haiti had uh, a Supreme Court, Haiti had uh, a Senate and a president. It's, it's very interesting that a country that the second country in the world to establish a democratic system, ladies and gentlemen, is very unfortunate to note, to note that uh, uh, institutional and democratic values have not taken roots in Haiti. Uh, so time and again, the Haitian people try to decide whether Haiti is an empire because the country was founded as an empire or whether Haiti should be a republic. So uh, those are the kind of questions that uh, eventually we will have to address if we want to really help Haiti in the long term uh, build adequate institutions and infrastructure. So the fundamental question that uh, before Haiti rush into elections, we need to ask what kind of democratic system is applicable to Haiti based on the country's culture and mores. Should uh, Haiti has a presidential system? Well, the president is the head of government and uh, doesn't have to uh, answer to uh, the legislature. Or should Haiti have a parliamentary system where the legislature pretty much decide who is the premier in Haiti and that legislature has the power to terminate uh, uh, the prime minister if they believe that uh, he is not functioning effectively. But it so happened since 1986, Haiti has the system and it has not uh, produced much result. So should Haiti introduce a bicameral system where you have a house and a Senate or should Haiti have a unitary system where you have just one uh, house of representative? Uh, how many political parties that you need in a country for it to be functional? Haiti probably has over 50 different political parties. It so happens every time you have a presidential election, a different political party uh, uh, get uh, elected to office. Imagine currently you have uh, PHTK, which is uh, the current uh, ruling party in Haiti. Before that, you had Unité. Before that, you had uh, the Lavalas party. Most of those parties really do not uh, have uh, the, cost, uh, the scientific basis uh, to operate as political parties. They do not have a, a macro, micro uh, economic policy. They do not have any uh, uh, fiscal or monetary policy. So those political parties exist in name only. And we can understand why that we have so many political parties in Haiti is because it's a very profitable enterprise. Haiti allocated $1 billion of its national budget for political parties. So basically all you have to do is to create a political party and you will have sufficient income to allow you to live a very decent life. But at the same time, in as much that such a system is very uh, attractive to politicians, those political parties do not have any institutional knowledge to function in a democratic society. And as a result, they do not provide any assistance to Haiti and to the Haitian people. Uh, Haiti is a very young country. And as much as Haiti is very old in the sense that a country that uh, gained its independence since 1804 and uh, one of the oldest democracy in the world, you know, uh, in 1806. But uh, from a numerical standpoint, the youth of Haiti, the median age is 23 years old. So I think uh, the youth of Haiti deserve to live in peace, stability, and prosperity. For that to happen, Haitian leaders must come together to create a progressive plan for Haiti. Uh, so uh, uh, I truly believe that uh, 
the solutions to Haiti is not to rush to elections, but to effectively have the kind of conversation we are having here today to decide what kind of institution, what kind of infrastructure Haiti need. And when we are able to come up with those kind of solutions, then eventually Haiti will be able to take its rightful place among the most uh, competitive country in the Caribbean region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mirsad. Thank you, Mr. Lucin. Um, the floor is open for questions. I actually have a question myself. Um, so as we know, Haiti has experienced many protests this year surrounding a multitude of economic concerns. Um, but of course, more recently, there was a series of domestic and international catalysts that led up to the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse. And so in a nation where international intervention more often than not results in the further implication of American policy, which certainly has played a role in the delusion of Haiti's sense of democracy, what can we expect to see in the near future? Uh, Rene, maybe we let other participants talk first and then uh, questions and the answers in the end. Because, okay. But uh, if you have asked a question, Claude, you're welcome to answer. Unfortunately, I do not believe the United States or the United Nation uh, will be able to provide any kind of assistance in Haiti, um, to Haiti. Imagine, uh, Haiti is one of the most peaceful places that the United Nation has been involved uh, for the past uh, two decades. Uh, the United Nations serve as uh, in a peacekeeping uh, capacity and uh, they acted uh, in a political capacity to help build the, uh, the institution in Haiti. None of the, those things have worked. Billions of dollars have been invested, but unfortunately they try to apply Western values to a country that uh, is unique from a cultural perspective. Uh, Haiti is a very complex place. Part of the reason of that complexity is that uh, Haiti has a history that is totally different from any other country in the world. Imagine, whereas uh, people speak of uh, uh, the impact of slavery uh, on a country, Haiti was able to defeat the best army, armies of Europe back uh, in the 17 and early 1800s. You're talking Haiti defeated Spain, Haiti uh, defeated uh, England, France, and Haiti has contributed to uh, uh, the very independence of the United States. Haiti singularly, uh, after defeating Napoleon Bonaparte and Bonaparte uh, decided to sell Louisiana. And as a result of that purchase, the United States doubled in size and became the great empire that it is today. So Haiti is very old. You cannot come and dictate to the Haitian people what you need to do. So what really, what kind of contribution can the United States make to Haiti? Very little. What kind of contribution the United Nations will make in Haiti? Very little. But how do you effectively bring those forces together? It has to be done in a very systematic way, in a very objective way. It has to be done the way we are having this conversation. We have to engage the Haitian leaders, not to rush them into simply having an election, uh, hoping that an election will uh, uh, provide the stability. It will provide the stability for a few days, for a few weeks, maybe even a year or two, but that's not part of the long-term solution to Haiti's crisis. If, uh, I don't know if I answer your question, Renee. You more than answered my question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, now, uh, Professor Reginald Darbone will take the floor and begin his presentation. Hi, good afternoon. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So with, with most things that I that I do, especially as, a, as an instructor, as a professor, um, I like to provide some historical aspect. And, and a lot of this is information that, that I'm sure most of you are aware of. And as uh, Mr. Louis Saint just said, you know, something that, that you know, I always stress and that, that's very powerful is that Haiti was the first successful um, revolution of slaves. And that's really significant. And again, to reiterate, Haiti beat France, Haiti beat Spain, Haiti beat 
um, the the English, it would be as if it would be as if Puerto Rico went to war with the United States and Puerto Rico won. That's really the you know how powerful and significant um, the Haitian Revolution is. So before I get into the you know my take on the constitutional aspect, um, you know I always want to reiterate the historical aspect and and how much of a role that that played. So when we talk about the, this Haitian Revolution and how successful it was, let's make no mistake about it. It was not a smooth revolution. It was not you know, something that was easy to do. No revolution is smooth. No war is smooth. Nothing involving human beings is ever really smooth. But the reason, you know, obviously why the slaves came together is because of a common enemy. We have, um, we have a saying in Creole. And it's, it goes, Depina Guine, Neg Gai Neg. So, what that roughly translates into is that ever since the motherland, man hated man. So, when we were you know, slaves um, on the island, it's not that we particularly got along even as slaves, because remember, we were brought from different parts of Africa. Sometimes we were brought from warring tribes within Africa. But again, what united us, united us was the common enemy that we had, in this case, the French. Now, once the French were, they were defeated, division and rivalry continued and resumed, and we still kind of see a lot of that today. Um, in fact, when Haiti first um, gained its independence, there were really two Haitis. There was, there was a Southern Haiti that was ruled by Alexander, Alexander Pechon, and there was a Northern Haiti that was ruled by um, Ali Christophe. And in fact, Ali Christophe declared himself King of the North. So we kind of had a, a Game of Thrones situation, if you will, um, going on even in that era. So, but I, I do also want to stress that these problems, this divisiveness, this issue, it's not, it's not just unique for Haiti. Because if we look at also the history and the constitutionality of the United States, the US also went, from to a, a, went through a certain similar situation, being that there were 13 colonies and these 13 colonies, they might as well have been 13 countries. And again, the only reason they, they united was to fight this common enemy, in this case, the British. So you see that parallel between the Haitian experience early on and the American experience early on. Um, and even after the American Revolution, it was a very fragile situation because most of the powers were with the individual states. And, and so we even fought a civil war to, to unite the country. So in Haiti's case, it turned out a little differently. And the reason is because of these external forces. And by external forces, let's be clear, I mean France and the United States. Um, let's not forget that France levied reparations against Haiti. It's almost like um, you know, the kidnapper releasing a person and still expecting to be paid ransom even after the release of the, the one kidnap. It's, it's just pure extortion. And by some estimates, what Haiti paid over six generations in reparations amounts to about maybe $21 billion in today's dollars. So, you know, so when we look at, you know, where we are today as a country, as Haiti, um, it, it, we have to look at um, where we came from and some of the forces that, that led to, or the factors that led to where we are. Now, that's kind of an over, overview and simplification, but that's kind of, you know, why we are where we are today. Now, in terms of the assassination of, of, of um, President Moise and, and what non, what kind of, I guess maybe brought us all here today, I think I can explain. So there are two questions. There's the why and there's the who. And I think most of us, I, I can explain, I think most of us already understand the why. Now, when it comes to the who, um, work in progress, uh, there are some theories out there, but basically President Moise made some powerful enemies. Um, and, and out of, you know, of course, respectfully speaking of the dead, um, in all honesty, in all fairness, President Moise was not necessarily um, a popular president. Um, by some accounts, he was a divisive president. Um, so again, you know, having made enemies and some of his, some of his, there are two views. His supporters would claim that he, um, he fought against a ruling elite class in Haiti 
that that are partly the root of the problem in Haiti because this elite class, it's to their benefit for Haiti to be in the condition that it is because it ultimately results in profits and power for them. So by some account, um, President Moise um, was a martyr because it was his fight against this ruling class, um, this the Haitian 1%, if you will, that led to, to his death. Um, his, his opponents would say that he embezzled funds, he ruled by decree, and he, he used gang violence to keep power and to control his enemies. And, and you know, all of that, you know, whether true or not, in my opinion, what led to his assassination is whether or not he was rightfully the president of, of Haiti. And, and, and Mr. Louis Sam uh, uh, said correctly that, well, you know, constitutionally, if he was, and by the way, the Haitian constitution does say that the president will serve for five years to begin February of, of the year elected um, until, Feb until five years um, later in February. Um, the question therefore becomes as of February of this year, when President Moise's term ended, was he in fact the constitutional president of the United States, I'm sorry, not the United States, of Haiti. So um, I looked at the constitution and it does in fact provide the five-year term and beginning in February, ending in February. I personally couldn't find anything that dealt with the situation of what happens if a president um, actually takes power later than, than um, when they were elected, which was again, in Moise's case, he, he was elected, but he didn't really fully take power until about a year later, which is why he claimed that he was still the president um, because he, he in fact took power um, a year later. Um, now that's neither here nor there, it's debatable, but some would argue that he's not, he was not the constitutional president of, of Haiti at the time. I think most would agree that ultimately that's what led to his assassination. Um, his refusal to give up power. Now, I don't say any of this to minimize his assassination. I do believe that there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And this was definitely the wrong way to do something. Um, and, and, and so now the question becomes, where do we go from here? Um, what do we do now? Um, and so there's a power struggle and, and like, like many of us Haitian, I think we are all hopeful. We are all optimistic. <clears throat> we are not dis, um, delusion. We're, we know that the road is difficult. Haiti's road, um, make no mistake about it, Haiti's road in the future is going to be a difficult one. It's going, I don't, honestly, I don't know that in my lifetime, I will see the Haiti that I want to see. I hope that in my kids' lifetime, definitely my, my grandchildren's, I hope that, you know, they'll see, you know, the Haiti that, that we all know that is that is possible. Um, but it, it, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a long road. It's going to be difficult. But I am optimistic that that we will overcome as you will. Um, so so that's again, my take on it is what led to Moise's assassination was the constitutional issue of whether or not he was president. Um, and that's, you know, that's debatable. In my personal opinion, I don't think he was the constitutional president of the United States after February of this year when his term ended. There may also be an issue of when he was sworn in, but again, the constitution says the term, uses the term election, not sworn in. So, um, so we'll see. And, and again, we're all hopeful and optimistic that um, Haiti will overcome. Thank you. All right, thank you, Professor Dardone, for your input. Mr. Robert, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, I'd like to thank the uh, wonderful Broward University for inviting me here to speak on the subject today, and uh, Professor Mirsad. I would like to give greetings to my esteemed co-panelists on the subject of what is going on in uh, IET, Haiti, which is the ancestral homeland for many of us. 
for me, the most important thing that has to be understanding has to be understood in terms of the current context of what is going on in this Haiti is that something that is very rarely really effectively explained has to be made clear in the conscious of those who are truly interested in what is best for Haiti and the Haitian people. Oftentimes we get a narrative of the Haitian revolution as simply a conquest or a battle against of the blacks beating all of the whites and slave plantation owners and the French. And very recently people began to realize that Haiti beat more than just the French, it was the British and the Spanish as well. But very rarely is there an explanation of the actual complexities of the internal class dynamics that not only had a role in the Haitian revolution, but also had a role in shaping the, the what would become the Republic of Haiti afterwards. First of all, one of the things that's most important for me to always understand when speaking about Haiti is the proximity of, the, of Haiti's revolution to the early uh, birth of the United States. When the Haitian revolution started in 1791, George, George Washington was president of the United States. We also have to understand that there were three categories of blacks on the island before the, uh, the, the, re the revolution begins in 1791. We had what were called pejoratively the Bosal. These were Africans that were born in Africa that were brought to the island, which means that they were more rebellious, they were less attuned to French culture, and they were more familiar with their various African tribal religions and, ritual and, and, and backgrounds. They made up up to 65 to 70% of the Blacks on the island before the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. Then you had the Creole Blacks who were Blacks born on the island. These, these Blacks were more attenuated to the French culture, to the French language. Some of them were free before the revolution, like Toussaint Louverture, who actually owned slaves. Some of them owned Bosal African slaves. And some of them were slaves like Dessalines up until the beginning of the Haitian revolution. Then you had the biracial or mixed race Blacks, what we in Haiti called the mulatto. I know that term is out of favor nowadays, but that's really the only way we explain them in the Haitian context. The mulatto uh, uh, Creoles were born on the island. They were mixed race between the French and the African. And at one point, they owned 25% of the African slaves on the island. So you, before the Haitian Revolution, when you have pre-revolutionary Haiti, Saint-Domingue, you have three categories of Blacks, all of which are basically in contest with each other. The, the Creole Blacks did not like the Creole Mulattoes because often the Creole Mulattoes wanted to be white and chose to inure themselves closer to their white patriarchs in the French language. The, the Creole Mulattoes did not like the Creole Blacks because they thought they were better than them because they were Black and they were not, they didn't have their class standing. And both the Creole Blacks and the Creole Mulattoes despised the Africans because they thought they were savages and beneath them. And they basically literally oftentimes treated them as slaves or owned them as slaves. This class conflict plagues Haitian society to this day. And very few people are willing to be intellectually honest about that. The revolution begins with, as we know in Haiti, as in Haitian law, ceremony Boakaima, which is a, a, a spiritual pact that the Haitian, uh, uh, Haitian African slaves, some were Muslims, some were voodoo animists, do in August of, of uh, 1791, and a week later, they start ravaging the plantations to the point where the French are in jeopardy of losing the island. Spain comes in, trains the high-ranking Black Creoles to fight for Spain because Spain wants to take the island from France, and they are, right, they are fighting as Spanish soldiers against the French. Because the French are afraid of losing the island, they come in and tell the Blacks and the, and, and the uh, mulattoes who are more culturally attenuated to the French that will free you if you fight for France against the Spanish. So those same blacks now become generals and soldiers of the French army and kick out the Spanish, the Spanish are out. The blacks believe that they are now good because they're gonna be treated as Frenchmen. Guess what? The British come in and try to keep, because they believe they can kick out the French and put the blacks back in shackles. The blacks fighting under, the, under France now kick out the British. They believe that now they're going to be on the top of the island because now they're being respected as Frenchmen. Napoleon takes over the over control of France and he says, put all these blacks in shackles, take off the epaulets of all of them and put them under our thumb or genocide the whole country. They come in, 
Dessalines takes over as uh, Napoleon, as Toussaint Overture is captured and taken to France, and with the might of, of bringing together the mulattoes, the Africans, and the Creole blacks at the Treaty of Akai, Akaya, they come together and they kick out Napoleon and save the United States from being conquered by Napoleon's army and basically create the Republic of Haiti. After Napoleon, who was assassinated because he wants to do land reform, dies in 1806 and is killed by mulatto Creoles and black Creoles because they want to keep their land share of the property. Basically, the Bosal are treated as indentured servants almost in perpetuity in the north. And the Creole mulattoes and the Creole blacks go to, go to war against, against each other, creating the Republic of the North, the, the, the Kingdom of the North and the Kingdom of the South. And everything that happens in Haiti from then on is a consequence of the assassination of Dessalines and the inability to empower those African peasants who did not get any wealth as a result of fighting in the revolution, who became the 70% of Haitians who are poor to this day. And until we address those class conflicts, which we now have, we now have an elite who are for people who are not even originally Haitian, they're mostly Syrians, Arabs, Lebanese, Europeans, German descendants who control over 90% of the Haitian economy. They make up the Haitian oligarchy, who I personally believe had a significant role in Jovenel Moise's assassination. They work in the, in, the, in the pockets of the State Department, plotting coup d'etats, kidnappings, and so on and so forth. Unless we neutralize the Haitian oligarchy, nothing will ever change in Haiti. And unless we change and neutralize this class antagonism, nothing will ever change in Haiti. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Robert, for your insights into Haiti's class conflict. Um, Dr. Edwards will be our final speaker. And so Dr. Edwards, whenever you're ready, you may begin. All right, thank you very much, um, Renee, um, for moderating. Um, thank you, Mossad, for putting this together. Um, and definitely thank you to my co-panelists. Um, it's interesting because I think you know you each my co-panelists, right? You each stole right some of my thunder. So I'm going to approach this from a slightly different perspective, um, because I am interested in polit political economy, and it's always good to think about um, how a country is situated within the global right political economy. Um, so I will give you history, but more near history. Um, so. Let's start in 2005. Um, you had 14 countries meet in Venezuela. Um, and this was the start of what we call Petro Caribe, which was the mastermind of Hugo Chavez. The idea was to sell cheap energy, cheap oil to Latin American and Caribbean countries. Um, obviously oil is a major um, burden or finance, right, to any country's budget. Um, so Venezuela obviously are doing their, you know, expand their sphere of influence. And you have Caribbean countries, right, that are welcoming, right, cheap energy sources, especially in 2005, right, we had the Iraq war and energy prices skyrocketing. Um, now, the original Petro Caribe did not include Haiti. Haiti and Nicaragua actually joined in 2007. And in that same year, Hugo Chavez went to Haiti and he made note that including Haiti in Petro Caribe was a debt, was a debt that Venezuela owed Haiti. And again, this is where you can go like, you know, take it back historically. And his argument was that, I believe it was 1815, the great revolutionary Simon Bolivar who ended up free in Latin, free in um, South America, he had to flee and he fled to Haiti. And Haiti, I believe under Petion at that time, were able to give Simon Bolivar not only right safe space, but also weapons and armed him. And the promise was, you know, you have to go back to Latin America and you have to free the slaves. And Simon Bolivar left Haiti and went back and did exactly what he was right ambitioning to do. Um, so that's Hugo Chavez's mindset, is we owe this country. And, and I think all my co-panelists done an excellent job 
in showing how integral Haiti has been to the entire Western Hemisphere, right? North America and South America. Now, between 2008 and 2017, Venezuela sent Haiti about $4.3 billion in cheap subsidized oil under Petro Caribe. 40% um, of it was repayable at an interest rate of 1% over a 25 year period, right? This is unthinkable. Um, so much of that fund was to go to development or developmental projects within Haiti. Um, it ended up being about $2 billion that was in Petro Caribe in Haiti's banks that was to go to infrastructure projects um, over that time. Interesting thing happened. Um, 2018, under Donald Trump, the Haitian government halted payments to Venezuela, right? And subsequently ended Petro Caribe. Haiti was also one of the first countries to acknowledge, or in other words, denounce Maduro and turn their back on Venezuela. Um, Jovenel Moise was one of the was one of the, the, the heads of state that recognized the opposition Juan Guaido, uh, Juan Guaido as the Venezuelan premier. In 2018, the IMF provided about $96 million in low interest loans. But again, the condition was that Haiti had to cut the fuel subsidy that they put in place under Petro Caribe, essentially ending that relationship. And it's no coincidence that the initial uprising, initial rise that started in Haiti was surrounding the increase in fuel and energy um, costs. So to, to give you an example of what Haiti, again, this is, the, this is larger political economic scope. You went from having cheap or cheaper subsidized oil to now having to source oil on the market. And the market pretty much means the US market, the US dominated market. Um, you had a company called Novum Energy. And it, it was an energy company that, that provided um, petrol and kerosene, kerosene oil um, to Haiti. And they would dock in, in the port of Port-au-Prince and they would not release a barrel of energy, of oil or kerosene to Haiti unless Haiti paid in cash for the oil. Now, if you think about this, right, it's a poor country, right? The poorest country in the Western Hemisphere having now to provide cash for their energy. And the company would charge the Haitian government $20,000 per day for every day that the, the tanker was sitting idle in the port without being able to unload its, um, its kerosene. So I want you to think about that political context. Um, now, you know, this was actually reported in The Intercept in 2019, related or somewhat not related. You had in February 16 and 17, 2019, had two Navy SEAL, two four Navy SEALs and two Serbian mercenaries fly from the United States in a private jet. They had six automatic rifles, six handguns, three satellite phones, um, various knives or whatever. And they flew to Haiti for what they understood was a mission to preserve Haitian democracy. Essentially what they did, what they were doing was to commit a brazen bank robbery. They actually went to the bank on a Sunday. Now the plan was to move $80 million that was left in the now defunct Petro Caribe account, which was controlled by the Haitian central bank manager and the prime minister to an account that was controlled by Jovenel Moise, right? These are the, these are the reports. Um, and they could have been successful, but what happened was a security guard at the bank, wasn't really sure what was going on. He alerted authorities. I'm not sure if any, any of you heard about it. Again, it happened, but we didn't talk much about the United States, but those mercenaries end up getting arrested. Um, you know, the similar scenes we see now with the, the assassins, right? Their weapons were put on display, right? Their IDs. Um, 
And again, they were the, the plan was again to move eighty million dollars. They weren't able to move it. Um, they ended up without much fanfare being released and sent back to the United States. Um, there were no charges filed. At a minimum, charges could have been filed for right um, traversing international grounds with weapons that weren't registered. Um, so within the next week, right? I think following that event, you had a huge shakeup with the prime minister and you had Marco Rubio. I think at the same time, he left the border of like Colombia and Venezuela and he went to Haiti to smooth it over. Um, there were no charges filed on the, the mercenaries and, and everything, you know, kind of went back to, to norm. And I think this is the situation, or this is the microcosm of Haiti. Haiti has not been an autonomous country. It has not had true sovereignty. It has tied itself to international actors, particularly the United States, that have a national security or national interest that has nothing to do with the prosperity of Haiti. So one way to look at this, I believe, is what do we expect going forward? And I think just last week you had people in Haiti, and I think um, Claude mentioned this, um, that were calling for more intervention by the United States. They wanted the United States to, to send um, possibly security to, you know, secure, you know, um, uh, special, right, um, resources or whatever else. We have to think about the larger geopolitical, and I think Reginald also mentioned this also, right? The transnational capitalist class um, that have been integral in um, emptying something like Petro Carib, right? There was the Petro Carib challenge. Some of you know about this or not, right? The Petro Carib challenge, trying to figure out where all this money went. Um, so that has been my approach. And again, I'm fully forthcoming. I am not Haitian, but I totally appreciate Haiti's role um, in the hemisphere. And I just think for the country that was able to be the first again slave country that successfully rebelled, that is almost a shame that it's the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. And I would point directly at that relationship that it has, that it, that it has had um, with the United States. And again, we can go from there and, and, and have that discussion, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Again, I'd like to thank Mr. Lisa, Professor Darbone, Mr. Roberts, and Dr. Edwards for joining us and sharing your thoughts and interpretation of the past and current, current turmoil in Haiti. The floor is now open for any members of our audience who have questions for our panelists, but I will begin with um, Fiacre Bienvenu who asks, the history, geopolitics, the myths of so-called third world developing nations and the thirst for power syndrome among elites. All that aside, what about the Haitian society and population itself? Is there anything that unifies the people of Haiti as one united front in pursuing a great governance? How do their needs converge or split in achieving this goal? Does the Haitian diaspora see things the same way when it comes to creating a great political order on the island? Last, is the problem more internal than external, structural or cultural? What is it truly? So I'd like to address uh, some of that question. I think that what the, the gentleman who was the last speaker was absolutely spot on in that uh, the larger, you know, even though I didn't get a chance to mention that in my presentation, because I really wanted to lay out the internal class contradiction, but the larger impediment to Haitian po political autonomy is the rather oppressive relationship it has with the international community and particularly the, the United States. What you have to understand is that since the US occupation of 1915 to 1934, when the US basically came in and you know emptied Haitians, Haiti's coffers for various intrigue, the fear of con competition with the Germans who were doing business with Haiti to protect the US interests in the Panama con Canal and, and also uh, help siphon off the money that we were paying in repatriation to the French. 
from that period of time, from 1915 to 1934, any, every time after that, the United States basically had the green light decision and who would be Haiti's president. And if it was a president that did not fit the particular needs of the United States, he would be removed. Like President Estime in 1950, who was removed because he was thought to be a quote unquote soft socialist because he wanted to increase the minimum wage. Like Aristide was removed because he was considered to be a quote unquote soft socialist because he wanted to increase the minimum wage. So anytime we've had a president that actually the people found some benefit in that you that tried to do a modicum of adjustment to benefit this, the super majority of Haitians who come from that Bosal African class that I discussed in my presentation who are poor, the United States has stepped in to hit them with a coup that has been conspired with those same oligarchical elites, particularly mm -hmm. the current manifestation of them who wants to make sure that the majority of Haitians who are basically poor people are ground to dust. As far as the diaspora, it's the sad reality of the Haitian diaspora is that many, some of them can maintain the same class perspective. If they were Haitian middle class or petite bourgeois, they had that worldview when they come to America. Many of them supported the coup to take out Aristide. So unfortunately, the class position of who you are in the Haitian diaspora may also determine what your politics are vis-a-vis -vis what you want to see in the Haitian vision. Yet sadly, because many of them live in the West and capitalist countries, they still want to replicate the capitalist development model of what's good for Haiti. Hotels, I want to go on the beach, I want to come to Haiti, As even though I come from the peasant class, now that I'm middle class, I want to go there and have my list of born servants that I don't pay, shine my shoes and do whatever. So unfortunately, the capitalist realism of the Western countries they live in wants them to go back to Haiti and replicate the same vile class hierarchy that's, that's grounding the, the country to powder because they've been more inured with that capitalist realism living in the West. So even that presents a contradiction and a problem for the development of the country. And these are complicated issues that some would say can only be solved with a Haitian Revolution 2.0. I wish I could be saying I'm not necessarily in disagreement with that. I actually am not, because these problems are long and they are definitely, definitely ingrained in the social fabric and cultural fabric of Haitian society. Um, I will. Renee, if you allow me. Renee, would you allow me? Yeah. Uh, let of it course, be known that uh, I, do not subscribe to the idea that uh, Haiti is uh, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It is uh, a cliche. It is uh, a very disrespectful uh, way of, uh, to, of trying to belittle Haiti, even in the mind of Haitian people. Now, if you were to say that Haiti is mismanaged, I would uh, definitely agree with you. Any country that has experienced the kind of brain drain that Haiti has experienced in the past 50 years would definitely uh, have uh, the kind of uh, challenges that exist in Haiti uh, from a political standpoint, uh, from, a, from an economic standpoint, even from a social standpoint. My friends, Haiti's society and Haiti's economy is extremely complex. If you were to ask the best economists in the world, what kind of economy exists in Haiti, most of them would not begin to know. But let's try to answer some of those questions. Haiti has what is known as a state-owned enterprise as the basis of Haiti's economy, which basically means the Haitian government control all the major sectors of Haiti's economy. When we were growing up in Haiti, and Haiti was a stable country, the Haitian government owned the telephone company, the electric company, the cement company, the flour company, the oil company, the steel company. So all the major entities that the country needs, that the people rely upon, they did not entrust those sectors to the private sector. Secondly, Haiti has a traditional economy, which basically means on any given day in, throughout the country, 
you have specific traditional markets that take place among the Haitian people, among the Haitian farmers. It doesn't matter what's taking place in the global market economy. It doesn't matter how much is the Haitian good. Haitian people are able to do commerce among themselves where they sell their goods and services. And then lastly, you have a free enterprise system where whatever the government doesn't control, it allowed the private sector to control. It so happened that uh, since 1986, the international community has adversely has encouraged the administration of Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the administration of René Prival to privatize Haiti's state-owned enterprises. When a Haitian person were working in those state enterprises, these people were able to live a working, if not middle-class lifestyle. And ever since those enterprises were privatized, the oligarch that someone mentioned earlier, they took control of those enterprises, sometimes closed them and decide to import those products instead. So Haiti does not produce almost anything anymore. Haiti used to be self-sufficient in every aspect of agriculture. Haiti produced sufficient rice to feed the entire population. Now Haiti is importing rice from Arkansas, from all over the United States. How do you compete with countries like that when they are dumping their uh, product uh, in your market? When you look at uh, the so-called uh, private sector, the non-profit organization, they raise hundreds of millions of dollars, but the most part, they keep that money for themselves and then dump all kind of uh, product to compete with the Haitian farmers and so forth. So, so it is very easy for people to just to disparage, to uh, belittle Haiti by saying Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. How a country, if it is one of the greatest country in the world, how could you dare say it's one of the poorest country in the world? When we speak of the United States, the United States, we are very proud because we are Haitian, uh, Haitian American. We are extremely proud of the United States and the contribution that we made to make the United States as great as it is. But when we define the United States, we don't use the term the most indebted country in the world. Do we use those terms? No, we do not. In as much as the United States owe more money than any other country in the world. So it is uh, very unfair. When I hear anyone use the term that Haiti is the poorest country uh, in the, Haiti has more infrastructure. If you look at uh, the asset that Haiti has. So if you say that Haiti is mismanaged, yes, I would agree with you. And maybe by saying that, you would uh, basically help Haitian realizing that, no, they are not one of the poorest countries. They are mismanaged and with a modicum of ideas, they can build the kind of institutions that they need so that they can uh, achieve stability and they can build the kind of infrastructure that they need so that they can build economic development. We, if we want to help Haiti, we have to uh, have the right language, have the right ideas, and most importantly, show respect. We're talking one of the greatest countries in the world. There's no way we should ever use those terms, Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, uh, sorry if you appear to be passionate, well, because I do not. I appreciate your passion, and you're absolutely correct. This is an excellent point. It, it's actually should be the starting point uh, of all discussions because that shows essentially the ability of Haiti to deliver, right? Once we take into account what you just said, it's very true. Um, I have, uh, I noticed that uh, Professor Felipe is with us. Professor Felipe, do you want to join us and comment on, on, on Colombian involvement if you have a, a chance or, or, or uh, uh, if you are here, please welcome. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Felipe from Colombia. I have to clarify that I'm not a specialist about Haiti or uh, United States, but my focus is the Middle East. So I have to say that before uh, starting my small uh, ideas. Thanks a lot to Professor Mirsad and thanks a lot to all our brothers in Haiti. Uh, I'm so sorry that Colombia is like, uh, you know, involved in this situation. Uh, what I can say from the Colombian people is that one thing is the Colombian government. Uh, the other thing is what some 
you know, uh, certain individuals uh, with Colombian nationality does outside the country. And the other is what the Colombian people think about all of this issue. Clearly, uh, we don't want to be involved in the other countries' affairs, and of course, not involved in this horrible assassination of a president, as you have seen. Well, uh, the reactions here are diverse. As I said, I'm not a specialist in this issue, but of course, when Professor Mirsad invited me to join, I was so interested because in the way I can get more information about this issue, I can maybe talk to my students uh, about this situation. Clearly, all the people are really embarrassed because this issue about the mercenaries uh, is not new in the Colombian state. We have seen uh, ex-military uh, members of, of the National Army involved in countries like Yemen, who is uh, suffering also from a war with the Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates, uh, United Emir Arab Emirates. We have seen this uh, issue in Iraq, of course, uh, after the, the US-led invasion of Iraq, uh, some Colombian people were involved in, you know, activities related to Black Border. So uh, clearly, uh, maybe one question for all our brothers in, in Haiti and uh, to learn, you know, from, uh, from, from you is, uh, what do you think about this uh, involvement of this uh, Colombian ex-military in the, in the assassination? What do you think uh, is the clue? Because what uh, many of you have said is really interesting. Uh, the, to know the why it's like uh, more easier to know who you know did did this uh, and in the who did this is involved a lot of Colombian people so until now what we are uh, watching here in Colombia is uh, that of course many people doesn't know about the politics of our brother nation uh, and uh, it you know, get us so surprised about this uh, situation when it was revealed that around 20 people, Colombian people were involved in this. I mean, this is not normal. As I, as I said to you, uh, it has happened before. And it, this is growing like a big issue in our country because, uh, you know, many people in, in the Colombian state are trying to say, okay, this is not related to us. I'm not telling that is related to the Colombian actual government, but uh, the way in which is repeating in many other countries is like uh, telling us that this is a growing issue in our country. And uh, I'm so sorry to, to, to have this reputation in Colombia, but uh, <laughs> what I can say is that, uh, of course, uh, Colombian people is not related in this. So my question, if anyone wants to, to, to tell some of the thoughts or ideas, is what do you think or what information you have about these Colombians uh, and who probably is behind the, the you know, the, the, the hiding of, the, of these people uh, as a, to target the, the president. So thanks a lot. And this is a small idea. I'm part of the public. I was not supposed to uh, talk, but uh, thanks a lot, Professor Mirsad, and thanks a lot to, to all of you. Professor Felipe, what university are you from? Uh, I forgot to introduce you. Ah, my university is Externado University uh, in Colombia, in Bogota. So you are really welcome, any one of you, if uh, the pandemia allow us to you to come here. I mean, uh, I will be very happy to welcome you in our university. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We have uh, quite often conversed. Uh, professor Felipe is uh, Professor of International Relations, and he's closer to my interest, but he was interested in this story. So now, who may ha actually address this question? And maybe relating to this question is this event in, in Cuba that are happening as we speak. So we have two. Uh, countries, um, essentially uh, neighboring countries in Caribbean experiencing turmoil. And there is that essentially clear foreign element involved in Haiti. And uh, um, perhaps uh, 
I don't know about Cuba, but in Haiti, definitely, as Professor Polito said, Colombians. And he, he just mentioned they're obviously being used everywhere else. Uh, and previously Serbs, which kind of interesting to me, right? Um, so looks like Caribbeans are, are somewhat uh, an interesting place to be in now. Right? So who, who, who may address this uh, element of international involvement uh, transfer, you maybe, or? Um, no, I mean, I, I can't, I can't speak um, much of that. So, oh, first of all, shout out to Fiakra. Fiakra, um, he's one of our old colleagues at FIU, so I know he asked the first question. So, shout out to Fiakra for the first question. He's in um, Ohio now. He's in Ohio. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's interesting that you bring up Cuba um, because that may be a parallel to look at. Right, you know, I've been to Cuba every year for the past three years. Um, right, Cuba, the Cuban government knows who's in Cuba, right? There is no way, right, you can have mercenaries enter Cuba and much less have access to, to weapons, right? The government is an autocratic government and it manages its people, um, up until, I guess, recently quite well, which contrasts, right, against Haiti. Um, where, as you see the reports, right, it seems to be a huge network of foreigners. And this is not, right, th this is, and again, this is maybe speaking to the openness of the Haitian society, right, and openness of, you know, of, of the Haitian community. But if you think about my, my earlier argument about autonomy, um, and I think Claude touched on some of this also in, 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 in his, um, in, in, when he last spoke, was for example, you have NGOs that operate in Haiti um, as a type of quasi-government, right? Now to talk, and again, to, to, to Claude's argument, right? Up until 1985, every single baseball that was used in Major League Baseball was actually sewn in Haiti, right? A lot of people don't know that, right? Haiti provided all the baseballs for Major League Baseballs up until 1985. Um, now, like it or not, you had a strong central government. The United States, with the, ons the onset of neoliberal right, economic model, says, look, we need small governments, you need weak governments. And there has been a concerted effort to move Haiti away from a strong centralized government, a strong centralized state, to essentially a weak state. And a weak state allows other actors to participate in politics, primarily the neoliberal model, it's markets. Um, and I think that hasn't worked in Haiti, right? As Troy points out, you have um, Haiti trying to compete with the behemoth of Nebraska in, in terms of corn or, or in terms of pork, right? In terms of rice right? so in these staples. Um, so I think there is something about the autonomy um, that Haiti has had to give up and I think it's related to the neoliberal policies that Haiti has actually um, taken on um, with the insistence of the United States that they believe in, again, small government, weak government, and allow the free market to reign. And it's very interesting. And I think um, Pascal brought this up, right? The previous time you had US intervention in Haiti was after an assassin, sorry, after an assassination. This was 1915, you had an assassination, which is, I think, the same month. It was July also, 1915. And you had, you know, um, American um, intervention up until 1934. Um, so I think symptomatic of the problem, right, that Felipe is asking is that, again, I don't know how this thing is still unfolding. We'll, I guess we'll eventually get to the bottom of it. But the larger question we need to ask is, right, like, Haiti probably needs to have more control um, over their state. And I think that kind of shows with what just happened recently and my example in 2019, where you had foreign mercenaries entering the country to rob the central bank. Like that's unheard of in any country developed or developing. So, so, so you you think that um, that kind of that it just happened to be that 
two crises are happening at the same time, or you're thinking that it's good to observe them and essentially have, uh, how do you say, comparative point where you have one very strong government with high like state capacity and one kind of government with a very low state capacity and how they dealing with the crisis, or you think there is more uh, more to it than uh, just the comparison between the two types of regimes and a crisis? No, I, did, I mean, anything we're doing here, right, is simplifying the issue, right? It's all these things are highly complex, but as a comparativist, um, I think the Haiti and the Cuban example is ideal in an academic sense to look at um, right, these issues and how they're going to play out. Thank you. And so, and then, then the Colombian just happen to be opportunistic kind of players at this point, right? So nothing specific about Colombia, or maybe, I don't know, any one of you, anything specific, or you think there's anything particularly interesting that Colombia is involved, or? I don't think this had anything to do with the Col Colombian government, except for the fact that they happen to have mercenaries that can be paid for by someone to, to seem like they're engaged in the act. We even, we're even having debates now as if they were even, as to whether or not they were involved. So I don't think this, the, the Columbia as a state has any role in this whatsoever. I think that, you know, basically this is a, a product of someone hiring out, you know, international mercenaries who were for hire if they did participate in the act to commit the act. So I don't see the role of the Colombian government being relevant whatsoever. I still hold to the belief that I think this was an internal, the motivations and the beneficiaries of this type of assassination would have to be an internal force. And I think at the top of the pyramid would have to be the Haitian oligarchy. That's my speculation with, of course, the green light of the State Department, because they could not have done something like this without the green light of the State Department. Some may disagree, but that's my, that's my ultimate belief. All right, so uh, maybe um, I, I was quite interested in uh, intrigued by the comments that Pascal made. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Professor Darbon, maybe you can address this. Uh, I didn't know about uh, this division among, among uh, cultural and social division within the Haitian community. And you know, can, can you highlight how that looks like in a diaspora, particularly because you were born here, and so you were not impacted by how you say, or maybe you're still impacted by those back home dynamics, despite the fact that you never actually, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever live in, in Haiti, but you know, you, you were born in the United States. So does this really affect even the second generation of Haitian Americans? Okay, so interestingly, um, and this ties into, there was a question about, is this really, um, internal or how much of this problem that we have as Haitian, how much of it is internal versus external? Now, it's, it's both. And, and from a diaspora point of view, although I was born and primarily raised in the United States, I have, I have lived for about a year when I was a, probably a teenager, a year or two in Haiti. So I am familiar with the culture, of course, being raised by Haitians. Um, so from, I guess, a point of view of more of a person Haitian American born and raised here, how much does that affect? It, it does affect because remember our families, even though we were born and raised here and, and we have diverse friends, our families are Haitian, um, both here and in Haiti. And now to address the internal versus external, part of the problem that, that we face, it's not just a Haitian problem, it's a black problem. So we blacks in America, have the same problem of division. We have the same problem of, and, and, and when I say the problem, there's a reason behind the problem, but it's a problem and it's a problem of lack of unity. It's a problem of, of when, when the question is asked, well, why can't, you know, why can't black people or why can't Haiti do what other groups have done? Like the Italians, like the Cubans, like the Venezuelans, like the Irish and so on and so forth. And, and that's a very simplified and unfair question because no other group in history has gone through, has been oppressed both overtly, intently, and systematically as black people and Haitian people and people of color throughout the world, including Africa. So, so the effect that this has, it's, I guess to me, 
it seems that we constantly need reminders as a race of how far, how much we need to unite. So if there's any positive out of this, the positive is that, look, it brought, it brought us together. It made this conversation happen. Not to say that it wouldn't have happened, but you know, it led to us being here. It led to you know these minds, um, Pascal, Claude, and 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 um, is it Ransford? Ransford? I'm I'm sorry if I pronounce mispronounce it, but um, you know these great minds, these intellects, you know things that 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 we're able to share. So, if there's a silver lining to all of this, that's the silver lining. Um, um, what is it? Um, in the, in the name of transparency, um, Renee, who is our moderator, is my daughter, uh, who I'm very proud of. And so part of it for me as a Haitian American is my part of my job is to ensure the generation after me as Haitian Americans, you know, continue to, to grow and to um, and to build us as a country and and future generations. So that's from a from a diaspora point of view, from an internal versus external point of view, those are my thoughts. Congratulations for your daughter. She's a wonderful demonstration of good Haitian parentage. Thank you, thank you. I'll take full credit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, let me quickly, uh, Renee, if I may. Yes, of uh, course. Let me quickly okay. say something about the mercenaries. Uh, it so happened that uh, in the hierarchy of mercenaries. You have uh, mercenaries from the United States. Actually, they are really not mercenaries. You may call them private security. So you, you could use different terms uh, to identify them. But from the international uh, business sector, they are considered uh, private security. And American private security, let's say, for example, most people are familiar with Blackwater, that former organization. If you hire one of their private security, it may cost up to $20,000 a month versus if you were to hire a Colombian person, it may cost $3,000 to $4,000 up to $5,000. So from, an, from the, an economic scale, it is more affordable to hire a former uh, Colombian military person to carry whatever, to provide the uh, whatever, you know, uh, assignment you want them to accomplish. Now, speaking of uh, ha the Haitian society, it may appear that there is division among Haitians, but at the same time, the solidarity that exists uh, among Haitians is so great that if it wasn't for the Haitian diaspora, Haiti wouldn't survive. Because what sustains Haiti economically is the remittance that come right here from the United States that allow a Haitian child to go to school, to be fed, to go to the hospital, uh, you know, to have a place to stay so far as well. And that phenomenon is not only applicable to the people of Haiti. Imagine this, if you have a young Haitian person who graduate from law school, whether from Nova, from uh, uh, Barry, from uh, FIU, that kid doesn't necessarily have to go to an American firm and say, give me a job. That person can open their own shop in the Haitian community and quite often they thrive and survive. Uh, 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 a Haitian doctor, if that person just passed their exam, these people automatically gonna open a thriving practice in the Haitian community. You may go to any Haitian community, rest assured that the grocery store is owned by a Haitian person so far and so on. Uh, the restaurant is owned by Asian person so far. So in as much that it appears that uh, there is uh, supposedly that uh, division uh, de Puna Guinea, uh, since Africa, black people are not, uh, uh, do not uh, support one another. Haiti to a certain extent is almost the exception. It may appear that we have that division among us, but the love for Haiti is greater than anything else. The pride, there is something special. If you were born in Haiti, there is something in that blood, something in that DNA that makes you so proud to be Haitian. I have to tell you, it was so difficult to encourage a Haitian person to give up their nationality. Whereas for a Cuban person, it was you know, you know, a natural thing to do. We had to fight. 
my parents' generation to tell them that you, you know, please become a US citizen. Mm -hmm. Even my generation, it was extremely difficult for us to become. Because why? Because to us, to be Haitian is something that you cannot compare that designation to any other designation in the world. You are so proud to identify yourself as Haitian. So Haiti is a very complex uh, country, my friend. So because the country is complex, I do not expect there will be simple solutions to Haiti's problem. Thank you. All right, we have some questions in the chat. The first being from Phoenix LOC. They ask, is there a way to support the young organizers working to build power in Haiti? I think Claude will be Claude. Perhaps you 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 are most in tune with the with local activities. So maybe you should provide us with some sort of link or some information where people can essentially connect. Uh, I think uh, this is the the appropriate question you need to ask. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a group of uh, Haitian students just published an article in uh, Haiti's oldest uh, newspaper, Le Nouveau List. And uh, they are uh, basically asking to have the kind of dialogue we are having here. They said they, are the, they represent the solutions for Haiti's problem. So therefore they are not expecting the United States or the United Nations uh, to come to Haiti. Whereas the Haitian government may choose to ask uh, for outside intervention. Let's say for example, as it pertains to the United Nations the Haitian people are adversely, they are totally against uh, any kind of intervention from the United Nations. Why? It has been a very unfortunate experience when those peacekeepers supposedly came to Haiti and introduced cholera to Haiti, where almost a million people, over 800,000 people uh, uh, got cholera because of uh, the United Nations uh, uh, peacekeepers. So, Haiti's relationship with the United States is slightly different. Uh, there is not so much animosity per se from, uh, uh, from, uh, 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 for the United States, but the Haitian youth, they want to be included in the discussion, whatever uh, discussion that is taking place, if we objectively want something stable uh, you know, for uh, long-term stability and economic development in Haiti. Is there any platform already, Claude, that people can join to? Is there any platform that people can uh, can join, a platform, local platform here? Uh, well, you do have several organizations. Uh, you have uh, those young people who say they're not sleeping. Uh, imagine this, you know, Nupam Dom, he's like, uh, we are vigilant. We're not, uh, you know, uh, you have a lot of organizations. But the most important thing is the older Haitian generation. The politicians in particular, they do not represent the interests of Haiti. The oligarch that uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned, those few economic elite who quite often, they are so Machiavellic that quite often they operate in the country and they have diplomatic immunity. Imagine you have uh, people who are committing all kind of uh, criminal activity in a country, and yet they, hi they hide behind uh, some kind of diplomatic community where they act in the country with impunity. These people are also the people who uh, introduce the kind of weapons that uh, we see in the country today because they own their own ports. They bring weapons, they bring drugs, uh, and they totally control Haiti's economy. They are the one also who hire those private securities to give themselves security. They travel in uh, 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 you know, uh, automobiles that uh, you, know, you cannot attack you know, because uh, those automobiles have all kinds of security. But these people are the one that uh, introduce the kind of uh, foreign uh, security system to protect themselves against the Haitian people. So it's a very complex situation. But the most important thing is if we want to help Haiti, we have to somehow find a way to engage the youth of Haiti. Great. Um, Boaz Levy asked a question in the chat. 
says, keeping in mind the fact mentioned regarding the median age of Haiti, how is the youthfulness of the Haitian population affecting the political climate? For instance, how is this age distribution affecting the class conflict? Or how is it interacting with the development of Haitian political institutions? I'd love to hear the thoughts of all panelists who would be able to provide insights on this and forgive my ignorance on the topic. Ms. Cole? I mean, I don't think I can really speak to that. I would like to hear those who really work with the youth to uh, give a perspective. Maybe Professor Delvon, you, you, you're working with you daily. Okay. Um, so to the extent that, that I you know, teach at, at Brown College, obviously there are students from, from all over. Um, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of any organ, any particular organization, be it at the student level or in the community level, um, that focuses on on Haitian issues or or Haiti for that matter. Um, in terms of in terms of the the youth population in Haiti, um, and 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 here's the sad thing that that I've often heard is that you have students in Haiti who graduated from medical school from law school who are reduced to either, either crime or either um, some other low paying um, um, job or have to come to, to the United States. So, so to kind of answer the question of the, the issue of youth and how that affects um, Haiti. And I, I believe it was, um, I believe it was Claude who mentioned the brain drain. I forgot who mentioned there was a brain drain, which means that for the youth in Haiti, the only salvation of many times that they see is to leave the country. And, and unfortunately, it, it kind of, it, the, the effect is a cycle where if the brain, the youth of the country, their desire is to leave the country, then what you have left in the country is kind of a competition of fighting in a lot of ways over scraps. So it's part of a cyclical problem that we have where because the population is so, so young, they quickly are indoctrinated into, into Western, got to get to the United States, got to get somewhere, got to get somewhere other than Haiti. So that's kind of another aspect of the problem that, that just complicates things. Yeah, like young people are known to have the highest expectations and they are known to essentially try very, uh, try hard to essentially develop quickly to, uh, to get into the position they like. So that has certainly a, a, a great impact on on how problem is being dealt with um, but also in being involved with the Haitian a lot of Haitian students I can say they are uh, they're quite quite good students some of the best students I had thus far are, are of Haitian descent and um, and that all, I'm always very very happy to see that and that gives me a hope that essentially what Claude is saying, of course, absolutely. I'm thinking, I'm looking at them and thinking, you know, these are great people. They have to find a way to somehow move from this uh, crisis they're in, engulfed with and uh, move forward. Uh, Rene, if we have any more questions, so we can kind of begin to wrap up. Yes, we have three more questions in the chat and I have one question of my own. And after this, we will begin to conclude our discussion. So Matthew Ferrero asked, how do you think the amount of political parties and amount of money they stand to gain has affected the mismanagement of the government? And if it is possible to eliminate the monetary gain of becoming part of the government would help get more Haitians on the same page and find common ground for choosing governance. I think perhaps mm -hmm. Professor Darbone or Mr. Uh, Robert maybe the best contestants to answer this question? I mean, my I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I'm very uh, circumspect about the potential for Haitian civil society. Because quite frankly, Haitian civil society works at the behest of whatever oligarch is paying them at the moment. So, it, you know, my, my, my position on anything dealing with Haitian governance is very simple. Even though the problem is complicated, I will admit. 
There will never be sovereignty of any governing force in Haiti unless the Haitian oligarchy is neutralized because they will always be the ultimate tool to neutralize even effective sovereignty that does not work in their, in their direction because at the behest of their relationship with the State Department at any time, they will pay a saboteur to protest, to protest against that government. They will pay gangs to put that government in jeopardy. So the notion of any type of stable sovereign government governance in this particular situation, I think is impossible until we deal with neutralizing the force that acts as an internal threat to any type of effective political infrastructure that is about improving the quality of life for the majority of Haitians. Um, to piggyback on that, I, I totally agree that the oligarchy, they got to go. Um, that is the root of the problem. Um, and it's it's interesting because they're so behind the scenes, it's almost like an invisible force. Um, Haiti, the, the governance of Haiti, look, honestly, to, in my opinion, it could be democracy, it could be republic, it could be communism, it could be socialism, it could be dictatorship. It's whatever the Haitian people prove. But the Haitian people cannot exert their will until the forces that are really controlling the purses and the strings of Haiti until it's gone. And it might have to be by any means necessary. It might have to be, it might have to be another, another bloody revolution, as Pascal said earlier, Revolution 2.0. It may come to, it may have to come to that. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, true change doesn't happen unless there's there's blood and there's revolution that runs through the street. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But based on my, my knowledge of history, my interpretation of history, world history, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that the problem is the type of government, but the problem is who's really behind and controlling the government in Haiti. So Ransford, you, th this is kind of interesting kind of observation. Is that, you, do you think this whole movement in the United States now with the, um, how you say, with recognizing uh, uh, a black struggle for equality will affect Haiti too? I mean, we're talking only about negative effects that, uh, that uh, current dynamics have on Haiti, but could we envision some positive effects like, a lot of good stuff is happening now in the United States. Obviously, you know, not without ease. I mean, not without difficulty, but do you think that may essentially also affect the dynamics in Haiti? Um, yeah, right. I think, you know, black consciousness. And uh, so this actually goes back to, you know, because I think past, like, each, of the, each of the panelists gave a historical narrative, right? You know, not, you know France, uh, it, Haiti defeating the French, right? The, the British and the Spanish. But a part of that defeat was also the American like slave owners. Because remember, they made sure that they didn't know a revolution was going on. So they kept the American slaves in the dark. Because if that, if they, if these slaves knew that, right, across the ocean there, right, you have a slave revolt, that may have meant something horrible for right, American like plantation owners. So even the Amer even the Americans were somewhat defeated during the Haitian Revolution. So I do think black consciousness, right, is, is contagious. Um, listen, I, as, I was originally born in Jamaica and right, my research will more likely focus on Haiti than Jamaica, right? So, and that comes from the idea of black consciousness. So I do, I, I think the fallout from this, right? Obviously with our heightened sense of social responsibility, hopefully will lead to greater consciousness and we can, try to reconnect this umbilical, right, between, right, Haiti and African-Americans, right, Haiti and Jamaicans, right, Haiti and anyone in the, in the Caribbean, larger diaspora. So I, I do think there is some, um, there is some connection, but it starts with forms like this, and it starts with education, it starts with understanding the role Haiti has had in this entire hemisphere. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Oh. Um, if Rene, again, if I, allow me. Uh, okay, basically, a uh, hundred years ago, approximately, a revolution took place in government where right here in the United States, they decided to 
professionalized government, a revolution made by intellectuals like uh, uh, Wilson when he was president of Princeton. They decided that politicians are not the most qualified people to run government. So therefore, if you can create a civil society, if you can create professional administrators who understand how to raise money, how to prepare a budget, and how to run local government, uh, then you would have more stability and uh, you will have more competitiveness. Over the years, as you can see, it doesn't matter what happened in Washington. It doesn't matter what happened in the state capitals. Throughout the United States, the professional form of uh, local government administration has enabled the United States to continuously improve itself. Uh, if you look at South Florida, for example, the economy that existed 30, 40 years ago is not the same economy. If you look at the, the major improvement in uh, uh, economic development, it's phenomenal. It's not the same Miami that existed then. Miami is more eclectic, it's more competitive. Broward County, for example, has very well-run cities and county government. So those things are not necessarily just unique to the United States. Those are basic innovation that has taken place in government that need to take place in Haiti and in countries in Central and South America. For example, you know that there is an immigration problem where people from El Salvador, from Guatemala, continuously come to the United States because those young people do not find jobs. Uh, but that's the very same situation in Haiti. Uh, someone previously mentioned that the Haitian youth, despite the instability that uh, take place in Haiti, those people, those kids have so much value for education. They still persevere to get their law degree, their medical de their, uh, degree in, in medicine, in engineering, so far and so on. But what happened when they graduate? There is no job, no opportunity. You remember I mentioned earlier, they used to have those state-owned state, state -owned enterprises that no longer exist. So I think uh, first, we need to introduce the notion, the concept of professional modern public administration to Haiti, where we can, uh, first of all, from an academic standpoint, we can have uh, American uh, or French or Canadian uh, uh, institutions that can teach public administration, for example, and help groom a whole generation of professional administrators who will be able to run regional and local government professionally. If you do an election and you have a Sweet Mickey or Jean-Bertrand Aristide, these people in as much that uh, they may uh, talk uh, to entice the population, but they do not have the expertise to run government. So part of Haiti's solution is to make sure reintroduce modern government uh, so that you could have good governance. And uh, remember, economic development is real. It doesn't, take, it doesn't take roots at the national level. That may be uh, a, a phenomenon that is unique to China because of their centralized economic system. But modern government has to be done at the regional, at the local level. And uh, if we professionalize Haitian's government, make sure that those public administrators get a decent salary. Let's say, for example, the city manager of Fort Lauderdale probably make 10 times more than the mayor. Why? That person is the person who is responsible to run the day-to-day -day, uh, you know, uh, operation of the city. Uh, we need to introduce those kind of modern uh, ideas to countries like Haiti, to Guatemala, and Central and South America, if we do not want to have the kind of instability that exists in Haiti and the kind of instability that exists in those countries. In addition to that, we mentioned earlier that Haiti, for the most part, historically, is the major enterprises are state-owned. So you have to somehow regain those state enterprises from the oligarchy. And when you do professionalize those enterprises, where if let's say, for example, in Haiti, there's no electricity. When I was growing up in Haiti, 
Haiti had electricity 24 seven, water 24 seven. But if you no longer, because of the brain drain, you no longer have the expertise locally to manage those institutions, put an ad in the New York Times, put an ad in the London Times, put an ad in the Miami Hill to hire the best administrator that you need to run whether it's the telephone company, to run whether it's uh, the electric company, so far and so forth. Those are basic intervention that we can make if we really want to help, help Haiti and especially help the young generation. That's an interesting point. Well, <laughs> hold on, Masai, let me jump in. Masai, let me jump in real quick, sorry. Yeah, so, this, this argument made by John Malcolm, also Strong Society Week States. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> No, so I, I find this a little bit interesting, right? Um, you know, and Mursad, you know this, um, 20, 30 years ago, right? This would be communism, right? I mean, what, 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 what is being suggested? Um, but I, I think a little bit pushed back with Claude in, term, in terms of the idea of this modern public administration, especially if you are getting it from the United States, right? Because modern public administration is the same old stale neoliberal model, right? It's the public choice, it's the new public management, it's built on small government, it's built on privatizing and introducing private actors into state development. And right, and I think Reginald mentioned this and Pascal, historically, you have no examples of a country developing without a strong government. Like, I mean, that's the myth they teach in like economic theory. But the reality is that all countries that have developed has had to have strong government, particularly during the, obviously the era of industrialization and whatnot. So I think if we are going to borrow, right, if Haiti is going to borrow ideas from the United States, right, it's going to look like the same neoliberal models that have failed and that has empowered the oligarchical class. And we're not going to get anywhere where we actually um, need to actually be. Well, not necessarily, Ransford. Yeah, that argument, even by Huntington, Huntington also argued the same, that, you know, communists are better in development and stuff. But I think what Claude is talking about, is talking about good governance, and particularly this type of, you know, John Malcolm, remember that book, Strong Society, Weak States? He talks about that meso-level, middle-level management, which essentially any leader needs so that they can essentially develop the society. So I think the Claude is talking more about that, like essentially good governance on that middle level, so that you know all these good ideas or developments can essentially take roots. Because what McDowell found, it's like that disconnect with no matter what leader you get, and this is what most of this society is looking for, some sort of you know charismatic leader that will take us out of whatever that misery that we live in. But these charismatic leaders, without that middle level management, without that meso level, how you say, of, of, of good governance, essentially are crippled. Because no matter how big ideas and how great ideas you have, and so this is maybe where both models converge. What you say, neoliberal, you know, model, Western model, and also like that development model that you know, other countries pursued, essentially on that middle level. This is where you know you need to develop that middle level so that you can combat strong societies, like uh, uh, Pascal have said the cases with with uh, with Haiti. So I don't necessarily think it's one or the other, but I see the point that Claude is made, making that you know without that level, it's very hard to come up and execute any type of policies. And in fact, that's what the Cubans are doing too. Right? They have that middle level that very much control stuff under the ground on the ground and are able to whatever do whatever they doing good or bad I, I'm going to withdraw my judgment but I'm just saying I think that's what the cloud was saying more so than just simply adopting um, uh, adopting neoliberal or any other type of model um, but I, I'm sorry I was just about to say that and then you you took over <laughs> all right. Um, any other questions, uh, Rene, or we have to conclude because I know that Professor Ansford has a class. He is teaching a very interesting class right after this. <laughs> and so go ahead. Okay, um, we have one more question that I'll address by um, Fiacre Bienvenu. He asks, why has former president um, 
Michelle Martelly been so quiet amid this latest political uh, wildfire? I have heard that he owns his own army and might be behind the murder of President Jovenel um, and that the Colombian mercenaries were staged, that he will eventually return to power and that he did not like the insubordinate Jovenel. Any truth to this conspiratorial story? The only factual allegation, the only factual element that we know is that Jovenel Moise uh, cleared the dossier of Laurent Lamont. Well, Laurent Lamont was the prime minister initially under mortality in the PHTK party, who had some type of questionable charge about either mismanagement or criminal, or might have been civil. And according to Haitian law, if, if, if a, a candidate has any type of political or economic malfeasance on their record, they are not able to run for elected office. And the, the actual agenda of the PHCK party, which was Martelli's party, since you cannot run consecutively in Haitian governance, it would have been five years for Martelli, five years for Jovenel, five years for Martelli, five years for Jovenel. What happened is that as a result of uh, Jovenel Moïse pardoning that charge of Lamont, he opened Lamont up to run against Martelli in the next upcoming election. So it would have disturbed that, that sequence that Martelli planned. And apparently there's a belief that Martelli was actually under the uh, guidance of one of the major oligarchs that is an antagonist to Jovenel. Much of this antagonism has to do with the fact that there's a question or debate amongst the PHTK as to how much can international actors be used in terms of development contracts to replace the oligarchy, since the oligarchy is so corrupt in extracting fees from the Haitian government for services. For example, Jovenel Moise's last trip was to Turkey. He had memorandums of understanding with the Turkish government to do development that would have displaced the Haitian oligarchy. Some argue that this was the, the one of the major linchpins that might have motivated olig oligarchs to have him taken out. So there is a debate as to whether or not Jovenel Moise and Martelli were on the outs because Martelli had basically had to now deal with the potential threat of competing with Lamont since, jo since uh, Jovenel gave, basically pardoned him and cleared his dossier and made him el el uh, eligible to compete. So there's not a I'm not going to say that Martelli had something to do with the assassination. He may, he may not have had. But the larger point is that there was grounds for points of tension in recent developments. And these are all things that happened within the last 90 days. Can I jump in and ask a question? Yes. Yes, of course. Okay, so I've been hearing about this guy. Um, I think his name is Jimmy Scherzier, or they call him Barbecue. Yes. Uh, what's his... Yeah, I, I guess give me some background. How does he figure into Moise and, and anything that's going on in Haiti? Well, he's, a, he's basically a, a, a gang leader, a major gang leader, he's a former police officer. And I think that, that Barbecue is a guy who was at one time paid by both sides. I think probably you would find that the oligarchs, as, as Claude said, paid for his guns and weapons. Uh, he, he, he is working against the oligarchs. He attacked the businesses of some of the major oligarchs, but also... The gangs are very wide and dispersed. There are some gangs that are attacking Jovenel and Jovenel support. You know, there are some gangs that killed critics recently. A woman named Netty, who was a, who a crit critic of the Jovenel administration, was killed as well. So the gangs are diff diffuse, and I think that both parties are basically using the gangs to execute this internal kind of battle between the oligarchs and those who are favorable to Jovenel. And I think that both sides use them for different purposes, but he's basically a major gang leader who, according to his rhetoric, is on a war path against the oligarchs and is showing sympathy for the, the, the Moise family and those who are supportive of Moise. Oh, perfect, thank you. Well, as we can see, Rene, come on. Uh, you, you said you have one more question that comes from you and then we could conclude, but we could see the excellence. We understand uh, more and more the problem is essentially Haitian community will find a solution, I'm sure, and hopefully it will be a nicer one. <laughs> Go ahead, Rene. Okay, so my question is directed towards Professor Darbone and Dr. Edwards. So essentially I'd like to know why is this happening 
happening so often in Haiti. There was the devastation after the earthquake in 2010, 2015 protests began in response to um, the start of Moise's presidential term. There was a 2019 response to COVID and, and then in 2021, President Jovenel Moise was assassinated. I'd like to know why does Haiti always have these adverse reactions to any sort of trauma? Because um, Mr. Luisin speaks of a Haiti that I'm not familiar with. Um, I know people my age have always known Haiti to be in a state of turmoil. So this Haiti that you speak of is completely foreign to me. So I'd like to know why is Haiti sort of always in this state or this in-between state of um, having an adverse reaction to trauma. Because there are people who want to prey on Haiti even more and more as a country is trying to fight for its own self-development. That's why. The enemies of the country are great, and sometimes they're greater than the people who control the country for its best interests. But we have our own internal problems as well. But, you know, you didn't ask me. This is my opinion, but I'd like to hear your father respond. Well, Renee, that's that's I asked myself that question, not just from a, you know, why is this happening in terms of the factors, but almost almost spiritually, like I'm not I'm not the most religious person, but I think of um, Job in the Bible who just goes through stuff and you're like, why? Like where you you know, if if you look at people who just go through misery in their lives and they're good people, you're like, why? So. So from that aspect, I don't know why. I really, I don't know why. From a theoretical academic aspect, there are forces in Haiti, internal, and since day one, and Claude spoke to this, is that, you know, we forget about this dynamic of the mulattoes, the black, the, the kind of black middle class and the black lower class. This has been a conflict in Haiti since forever. And the revolution, didn't, didn't solve that. The revolution just got rid of, on paper, the French factor, but not really. So why does this keep happening? You have external forces that, I and I personally think that while we can say we are the first black independent nation or the first successful slave revolt, there are forces who will never let us forget that. There are forces who want to show us as an example of of what black people are not able to do. I think there's some aspect to that as well. I think that colonialism, what it does to any group of people, anytime that you have, you have slaves on a plantation and the master of, that, of those slaves tell, tells his slaves, you're better than the slaves of the other plantation. And a slave being a slave, a person being a person wanting to believe that I'm better than something, buy into that. So the Jamaican slave master will say, you're better than the Haitians. The Haitian slave master, you're better than the Jamaicans. And, and, and it happened in America, it happened in Africa. So part of it is this external force. Part of it is this indoctrination that has happened over centuries. And so the combination of those external and internal, and I don't know if you want to say bad luck um, and mismanagement and everything that we talked about today, that's why this keeps happening, at least in my opinion. Uh, Mr. Luisin, do you have perhaps anything to add? Yes, indeed, uh, Rene. I think I owe it to you to explain that most recently. Rene is the third generation, Claude. Rene is the third generation, so be, be kind to her. She just, she just the third generation Haitian American. Uh, I realize that. Imagine this, uh, Rene. Haiti was among the first countries electrified in the world. When my grandfather was growing up, he can take the train from, uh, he, grew, uh, he lived in a city called Cabaret, which is not too far from Port-au-Prince. He just took the train and then in less than half an hour, he was in Port-au-Prince. Guess what? We no longer have train in Haiti. When I was growing up in Haiti, you wake up in the morning, and the clean, I mean, the streets are clean, clean. Today, you have garbage everywhere. When I was growing up in Haiti in the 1970s, yes, you had the national television. Haiti had cable television. When I came to the United States, there was only three channels, 
ABC, CBS, NBC. Yet we had cable television in Haiti before, before it became, uh, you know, common, you know, as, as it exists today. When Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor wanted to go to vacation, the best exotic place they can go in the Caribbean. They had two choices, really, Cuba or Haiti. Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton for their honeymoon, the best place they can go was Haiti. To be uh, uh, a taxi driver at the time, you had to receive formal training. Imagine this, before China acquired all the manufacturing base from the United States, the first country in the 1970s to build those industrial parks was in Haiti. Because you had Haiti employed hundreds of thousands of people in the industrial sector to produce all kinds of things, not just baseball equipment. Haiti was the largest baseball e equipment producer in the world. We've lost all those things. So we privatized ha all of Haiti's uh, state owned enterprises. We just transfer the same way you see the United States transfer its manufacturing base to China, we have transferred. What has sustained Haiti over the years, the state economy has been transferred to a few oligarch family, the 1% who control all the wealth in the country. That is Rene. These people, they represent the problem that we are experiencing today. They represent the instability. Imagine who owns Port Everglades, the people of Broward County, who own the international airport, the people of Broward County. In Haiti, you have private individuals who have their own ports. They are competing with the state government. They are the one who hire the private mercenaries, provide them with security. They are the one who destroying Haiti's local economy. So if you are recognized, the Haiti you, 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 you recognize today, it's unfortunately a very unfortunate situation, but it can be done in no time. All we have to do is just have the kind of conversation we have today. We need to modernize Haiti's government. We cannot allow a few elected officials to simply run the country for their own best interests. Imagine this, when President Aristide was elected president of Haiti, he probably, his net worth was that probably $10,000. Today, it is estimated that he's worth eight hundred million dollars. How does that happen? Just Google. Just Google the network of Shobert. How does that happen? He never even finished one term. So when you have political parties get millions of dollars just to operate, so you know what that creates? It creates instability. Because if you have, instead of having 50 or 100 political parties, if you only had two political parties, the same way it exists here, you have the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. At least, even when they are not in power, they have what you call institutional knowledge. But when you have a Jean-Bertrand Aristide who is elected president, but he, does, he's not, he never served, not even as a commissioner in a municipal government. So he doesn't understand how you run government. When you take a sweet Mickey who is an entertainer and you elect him to become president, he doesn't know anything about how government operates. So, it's not difficult. You have the problem of Haiti. We are having this discussion in an academic institution. So you have to look at Haiti's problem from an academic standpoint. Politics is a science first and foremost. And politics has everything to do with economics. If we cannot objectively decide what kind of institution is applicable to Haiti, we can start from now till eternity. We will never ever be able to help Haiti uh, achieve the kind of stability and the kind of future that you deserve. Thank you, Rene. Excellent. Um, Rene, if you don't mind, I can maybe kind of wrap it up. Thank you guys for all for participating. And thank Rene also for moderating it. That's, uh, you know, she's, I know the professor tried to claim that she's his daughter, but also she is our student. She was an honor student in Broward. And we like to highlight, there are more of them, but I, uh, I asked Rene to participate. Some of them were, also present today. And like uh, our guest said, they already finished you know, various institutions, the best institutions in Florida, and they are still keeping in touch with Broward College. Why? Because they recognize Broward College as a, 
as, as their institution. And uh, we are happy to serve as a platform for this type of conversations. And we are happy to essentially assist our Haitian community in the future, maybe to create more of this type of discussion so that we can essentially produce that necessary knowledge. You see, it was quite nice to see connect Renee and Claude so the Claude can tell Renee because she says, I don't remember. I can tell her of those days when, when Haiti was essentially uh, um, you know, much better in a much better situation. So guys, thank you. I can express enough appreciations to all of you. It was a very important conversation. Uh, trust me, you did amazing job for my students and for the rest of the community. I'm sure many of the people had not uh, known all these things that you told us. Now with this in mind, we can better understand, you know, the news that we're hearing. And uh, I find the reasons for hope. Um, I know it's not gonna be easy, but I find the reasons for hope for Haiti and um, it, it, it sooner or later, the, the things will get better. And uh, as I said, look at these people. And when you see this, uh, excellent intellectuals and even young people, I have only reasons to to hope that things will improve. Um, unless anybody has any concluding thoughts, we can finish. Thank you, Marsad. Thank you, Pascal, Reginald, Claude, Renee. Um, you've all been awesome and the audience. Really appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. And uh, I think we're all going to enjoy watching uh, Pascal's uh, podcast. Pascal. Yeah, nice? Yes, please, uh, to promote my podcast. This is Revolution Podcast. You can get us on YouTube, on Facebook, live. We live stream Tuesday nights at 9 p.m., Thursday nights at 9 p.m., Saturdays at noon. And you can get us, you can listen to us on all your podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Podcaster, Spotify as well. This is Revolution Podcast. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, I will essentially post your, your, your thing in the chat. So those who want to see it can join and see there. And um, thank you again, Professor Javon, thank you uh, for, uh, for participation and for raising this wonderful daughter. <laughs> Claude, as always, um, I'm so impressed what, with your knowledge and you're quite important for Haitian community here in South Florida. And I hope they essentially appreciate you as much as I do. Um, and with that said, I'm gonna uh, finish. And so I hope to see you soon again. <laughs>